just kind of settle myself a little bit here and uh, spend a little bit more time in John chapter 15 as it pertains to the bride of Christ. I um, also want to ask you to be uh, praying for um, Dana, who lost her grandmother yesterday, and Sister Tori, who lost, her, uh, lost a cousin's husband yesterday. Uh, it wasn't yesterday, Dana, I'm sorry. It was about a week ago, correct? And then Tori's was yesterday. I apologize for that. And then I'm also going to ask my lovely wife to join me on the platform for just a minute. Okay, she's going to go in the back. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start going because she's not as ready as I thought. So, um, John chapter 15, if you would open up there and uh, we'll kind of get ourselves set here. John chapter 15, and we are talking about the bride. And yes, you see some apples up there and some other things. And uh, uh, I will explain that to you in just a minute. Um, and here she is, and I'm going to hand her the mic so I can put my glasses on and see. At this time, we have a very special birthday today. Sister Brenda, if you will come up. Sister Brenda is celebrating a birthday. And we know Sister Brenda is one of the mothers of our church. We also know that she is an associate pastor here. And it's very, we, we can't go without saying happy birthday. Extend your hand this way, and just in, in the sense of a blessing and a, a birthday wish and a happy birthday, you're going to leave. I'm not seeing this thing. Uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Sister Brenda. Happy birthday to you. She doesn't look bad for a 26-year-old, does she? <laughs> and then I will hand them to you on the other side. Okay. John chapter 15, remember the last time we were together, we were talking about bearing fruit, and uh, we're talking about the bride of Christ. As you can see, bring a couple of our, our guests up to speed. We have up here the, the, wedding, the wedding gowns, and then this is the high priest outfit. When we see Jesus again, he will be dressed like that, and so uh, the days of uh, the crown of thorns and the, uh, the lashes on the back and all of that, those days are gone. And the next time we see him, the Bible says we will see him in his triumphant state, although he will still bear in his body the marks of his suffering. He will not be appearing to us in the humble way that he did. He will be appearing to us in might and glory and power. Uh, Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning those who are asleep, that the trumpet of the Lord will sound, that the dead in Christ will rise first, and those which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet him in the air, and so will we ever be with the Lord. In the um, Gospels, it says that this saint, why you men of Jerusalem, are you sitting there looking up or gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus that you see go will return again in like manner. And so we will experience a triumphant Christ. So we are not serving a dead God. We are not serving a suffering God. We are not serving a battered God. We are not serving uh, a humble God. We are serving a mighty God, a triumphant God, a healing God, a successful God. And so many times in our relationship, in this bride of Christ relationship, I think we focus a lot on what Christ can do for me. And, and this is what I want to say to you today. This is, it, it, this is the whole, the whole um, uh, center of this sermon. Don't be in a relationship with Christ because you want a rich man. Let me say it again. Don't be in a relationship with Christ because you want a rich man. Uh, you know, people who have money have to be careful, men and women, because they are surrounded by people who want to be with them strictly because of their money. Now, I am not at all questioning love. 
I'm not questioning that, you know, love doesn't know the bounds of time or age or any of that. But I always, how many of you, and, and let's be honest, how many of you ever question when you see like this 95-year-old man and this 25-year-old supermodel? Does it ever go through your mind, come on, really? You know, come on. And, and so you see that all the time. It's gotten to the point, it's gotten to the point that if you have money, and we're in John chapter 15, we're going to read some scripture in a minute. If you have money and you're going to hook up with somebody, especially if you guys have only dated like six months, it is probably in your best interest to have what is called now a prenuptial agreement. Anybody here, by the way, got a prenuptial agreement? I thought about getting a prenuptial agreement and having one with Sister Sweeney, but I don't have anything. So what are we going to agree on? We agree already that I'm poor. We agree already that I don't have any assets, so you know, I can't have a prenuptial agreement. But it's, it's this prenuptial agreement. It's where you, you come together over an attorney and say, in case this doesn't work and we don't stay married, and forgive me for my lack of the king's English, this is all you get. So if, if this doesn't work, you're not ha getting half of my fortune. You know, it's amazing to me. Um, be careful how I say this. But if you're married and you don't have a prenuptial agreement and you have a killer retirement and you get a divorce, half your retirement's going with your spouse. It doesn't matter that they never earned a dime of that money. By putting up with you, that is earning enough. And you will have to give up part of that money. You will have to give up half of your house, half of your car, half of your couch. You know, you can have to give probably half of your dog. And what I mean by all of that is somebody has to buy somebody out. Okay? It's not that Medea thing where you just come in and cut it all in half. Okay? That was in the Bible, though, over two mothers, wasn't it? And, and what did King Solomon say? Would you cut the baby in half? You know, so that's where it all started with Solomon. It's his fault. So everything goes down the middle. And so you have this prenuptial agreement. Can I tell you something? There is no prenuptial agreement with Christ. Okay? There's no prenup. And the reason there's no prenup is because God already knows what your intentions are. And so if you're with Christ for the reasoning of getting something out of it, then God already knows that's the intent of your heart. And the Bible says in chapter... This is... Let me say it this way. I'm going to go in chapter 15 in just a second. Yeah, I'm excited about this sermon. I love preaching this stuff. Listen, John chapter 15 is God's prenuptial agreement. Anybody ever seen it? God has a prenup in chapter 15. If he ever had one. Now, it's not official. That's why I said, you know, Jesus doesn't have a prenuptial agreement. But if he has one, it's John chapter 15. This is God's prenuptial agreement. And we want to look at this real quick. You guys okay with that? I want you to look at a person next to you and say, this is your prenup with God. Okay? It's, it's become so popular now it's not even prenup, so it's a prenup. I'm going to ask again just in case. Anybody here have a prenup? Okay, nobody has one. So we got to get some rich folk up in this church, man. <laughs> Thinking about getting one? <laughs> Your prenuptial agreement would be your death certificate. Yes, ma'am, I know. I can see it now. I, I can already tell you, if I said to Sister Sweeney, I'd like us to go to an attorney and, and create a prenup, she'd be just like this. Excuse me? The last thing that I would hear on this earth before going to be with the Lord is Sister Sweeney saying, how do you reload this thing? Okay. So I, I, I'm going to skip on the prenup. I'm okay with that. But, but if God had a prenup, this would be it. Okay, John chapter 15. I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. It says husband, husband in there, but I'm saying vine dresser because that's what it means, vine dresser. Every, listen to me. Every branch that is in me that beareth not fruit is taken away, and every branch that beareth fruit is uh, he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Let, let me say it again. This is God's prenup. Okay? So if you hooked up with Jesus to be with a rich man, you got a problem. Because there's a prenup in here. 
And the prenup with God is that every branch that beareth not fruit is what? Taken away. And this is even the tough one. And every branch that does bear fruit is still cut back so that it can bear more fruit. You, you got that? So branches that are barren are cut off and branches that are fruitful are cut back. And so there are people that want to question why do good, bad things happen to good people. There are times in our lives when God wants to prune us back. And can I just tell you this? The pruning process is never easy. It's never easy. And it never feels good. But it is necessary. And so we have to understand that this process that God puts us through, this is a process of personal holiness. It is committal. It is a sanctifying process that God puts in place. But if God ever had a prenuptial agreement, I want us to get this. You can be the bride if you choose. But if you're not the kind of bride you should be, then you're going to be pruned away. You're going to be cut off. And so if God ever had a prenuptial agreement, this would be it. Look at what he says. Let's read a little further together. Now we are. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye accept, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. I want us to get this. And this is why I want to linger a little bit in John chapter 15. We are not able to bear fruit without him. We have two children. And, and let me say this. The reason why we're doing this whole thing, I want you to get this. Okay, I want you to get this. Everything in the natural world created by God runs parallel or images everything in the spirit world. Everything. That's why Jesus talked to them the way he did. See, Jesus knew he was talking to an agricultural society. And so he starts talking about binds. The reason he's talking about vines is he knows they understand what that is. Okay, so he's talking to them in terms that they can understand. Let me just say this to you. If you're in a relationship with Christ and you don't understand where you are, you don't know what the will of God is, you're not getting what God is saying, then you need to check your relationship because something's wrong because God always speaks to us in terms that we can understand. Most of the time... If he's not speaking to us in terms we can understand, it's because we don't want to understand it. Or that it's not God. Because Jesus himself said, and, and, and we struggle with this, the will of God thing a lot, don't we? But Jesus said himself that my sheep know my voice. But how come if, if his sheep know his voice, how come we struggle so much with hearing what it is? Most of the time it's because we don't want to hear what he has to say. We're not feeling him as we could say or we might be saying to God as Jacqueline said to hit her mom one day at the at, at the table at a restaurant talk to the hand okay and that's the last time Jacqueline said talk to the hand okay if we ever say talk to the hand of God oh that'll be the last time we say it because God also tells us those that he loves he chastises those that he loves he cuts back can I tell you something you may be in a place in your life where you're being cut back Okay, the problem is that we don't want to be cut back. We want to focus on the fruit, don't we? We want to focus on the fruit. Everybody here likes to focus on the fruit, don't we? Now, we want to focus on what looks good, what smells good, what tastes good. And we hear it in preaching all the time, don't we? We focus on the fruit. We focus on, on what we can see. You know, it, we are always... How many times did my mama tell me, maybe not in these words, but my mama told me when I was younger, all that glitters is not gold, and yet I have chased some stuff in my life I should have never chased. See, the big question with Christ, he is commanding us to bear fruit, not only this, but he's telling us in John chapter 15 that our lives are characterized by the fruit that we bear. Now, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Galatians, where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and we kind of worked through that. This time, I'm not talking about the fruit of the Spirit. I'm talking about the fruit that we bear, okay? The fruit that we bear. Now, the fruit of the Spirit should be evident in our life, but we've moved on from that now. Now, we're talking about the fruit that we bear. 
And many times in our preaching and our teaching, especially in the church, the modern church we're in today, is we've lost focus of what the fruit is. See, we've lost focus of what the real meaning is. See, if you see an apple orchard, and I love apple orchards. Apples are one of my favorite fruit. I'm not so sure that this is the fruit that uh, Satan used to trick Eve. I'm not so sure of that. I think it was like guava or kiwi or something like that. God would never make a, a, something this beautiful to trick somebody. It would be that furry fruit that tricked people. But I love apples. I love apple orchards. Now, I want to do a disclaimer. I'm going to be, in just a few minutes, asking some of you to come up and choose an apple. Um, they are not washed. Okay, they are straight out of the bag. And how some of you people act. Okay, so they are not washed. So don't go back to the sea and eat it and get mad because I, I, I said after the fact that it wasn't washed. It is not washed. Now, you could do what most normal people do and just do like this. And then, now it's clean. Okay? John chapter, John chapter 15 says, you are clean, but not all of you. Okay? So this side of the apple's clean. See how shiny it is? Would you like a bite? See how shiny it is? Okay? It's clean. This side is clean. Okay? But, but I, when, I, when I see an apple orchard, I think it's beautiful. I look at all the apples there. They smell so wonderful. But can, can I tell you something I want to warn you about something? Just in the beginning, we'll talk about this later. You know when you go into an apple orchard, you know how it smells? It really smells good, doesn't it? Can, can I say something to you? The majority of the smell of the orchard is coming from the rotted apples on the ground. Because this will send out a smell. Okay, in order to, listen, listen. Anybody here got a knife? Rob, you got a knife, don't you? Oh, come on, man. Anybody here have a knife? People saying, Pastor, most of us are saved. We don't. Could you go in the back and get me a knife? She said, here you go. You got a knife, baby? You my kind of woman. Okay? Most of the smell, I'm going to move on until they come back. Most of the smell comes from the rotted apples. Let's go back up here and just, I should have brought a knife. I didn't. Any other time I have one in my pocket, you say, Pastor, you carry a knife when you're preaching? With you people, I do. Okay? So, so our, our, our life is characterized by the fruit we bear. And, and this is a, also a disclaimer. Those of you who are here today that are not planning to be here next week, sorry, I'm not going to finish my sermon today. So this is a two-parter, and actually, I'm not going to finish it next week because I'm not preaching. So it'll be the week after. So you may have, may have received a reprieve. Unless you're a certain gentleman I know, and he's not going to be here either, and that's his problem. He have to get the CD. Anyway, we, <laughs> I love messing with people. It's such power up here. It's such power up here. Let me, let me take a minute. <sighs> yeah, go into ministry. Go into ministry. This is the best part. This is the funnest part of it right here, because when you get down off of here, all that power is gone. Okay, so we have to understand that when we're talking about fruit, Jesus says that we're characterized by the fruit we bear. In other words, it will, it will, be, our, our, it will be our either doing or undoing, the fruit we bear. It's also important for us to understand that in the relationship with Christ, this is, as I said, this is the prenuptial agreement. The reason this is here is so that he helps us to understand that there must be production in our relationship with him. He is not going to allow us to be in a relationship with him and only focus on what he does. The majority of our relationship is what he does in reference to us. In other words, most of your blessing in your life is going to come as God responds to the fruit that you bear. Okay? Now, when I go into an apple orchard and I begin to look at that orchard and I see those beautiful apples and I smell those smells, the last thing on my mind is this. This is the last thing on my mind. This is the last thing on your mind. All we see is the finished product. But in the process, somebody had to plant those apples. Someone had to cultivate those trees. Someone had to, if you, if you ever noticed uh, in some apple orchard, there's actually dogs in there. You ever wonder why there's dogs in an apple orchard to protect the apple trees from the deer? Because the deer will come in and strip those trees clean. They'll even eat the bark off the tree. 
and kill the tree if they get an opportunity to. So a lot of times these, these older farmers, come on, man, quit wrapping it up and all that. Man, pull that thing out of there. They ought to be scared. And so, and so uh, they put dogs in the apple orchard to keep the deer from eating the apples and, and stripping the trees and killing them. And so, so Sweeney running already. She said, he's got a knife. I'm going to sit in the back. And so uh, when you look at an apple orchard, the last thing you think about is this. Can I tell you something? Before you can ever get this, there has to be this. Amen? Let me say it again because some of you are looking at me strange. Before you can ever have this, you have to have this. And this happens long before this. Can I, can I tell you something? Some of you are in this stage in your life. God is doing something in your life. Can, can I tell you something? Don't be in a hurry to get here. Because how much work you do here, will be, will, that will then dictate the quality of what happens here. Amen? You ever had a bad apple? How many times our parents talk to us about bad apples? Amen? Don't get involved with a bad apple. Hey, he's a bad apple. Why are they saying that? Because there's something wrong with them. There is this piece of them. The apple looks real good until you get to the one side. And when you get to the one side, you see that it's rotted. It hasn't quite gone through yet. It was just on the, underneath the surface. And if you know what you're talking about, you know what you're looking for, then you can see under the surface. Can I tell you something? How many times has the Holy Spirit warned us about something and we have allowed ourselves to be tricked by what we see rather than what was actually there amen and so we're talking about fruit what kind of fruit are you bearing and there's different christians some christians some guys people are bearing no fruit on or cut off but sometimes the fruit we bear isn't the quality of fruit it should be and god has to prune us back in other words there's things in our lives that aren't pleasing to him there may be some stuff in your life. You may look at it and say, hey, man, I'm praying. I'm doing everything I should do. Demetrius, I need you to, you're such a man of vision. Could you bring me that towel back? I didn't know I was going to poke my finger in that rotted apple. It just kind of happened. Let me just say this. Outside of setting it up, I don't plan the rest of it. It just happens as it happens. I'm, I'm not talking about the sermon. I mean how I act. The sermon was planned. The how I act part, that's why our sound crew is so hesitant to put us live streaming. They don't know what I'm going to do. I've tried to be better. I've tried. I think I've gotten better. I'm not sure, though. We're not live streaming yet. So I, I, I don't think that I'm quite where they need me to be. But it's the quality of fruit. Amen? And so when you look at the quality of the fruit, there are times that God has to cut us back. He has to prune us so that our fruit will be better. And so I want us to understand, some of us might be in the cultivating process in our lives. You say, I've been saved for 30 years. It doesn't matter. You're constantly being cultivated by God. So you might be in the cultivation part of, of what God is doing in your life. Or you may be in the pruning back part of what God's doing in your life because God wants your fruit to be better. It's all about, let me say this to you, it's all about you and me. It's not about God. It's not about God having his way. It's not about God doing what he wants to do. It's about us. He wants to give us. If you, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more does your Father in heaven desire to give good gifts to you? It's about us. It's about us. But see, the problem is, and, and, and I'm going to kind of go this way this morning, and I'm debating because I, I, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to go too far and, and leave you guys hanging, so, so let me say it this way. We need you in our relationship with God, in our love relationship. We spent too much time focusing on the fruit and not enough time on preparation. Okay? And I'm telling you, watch this. This is why you have unhappy Christians. I'm going to show you something real quick. Guys, I want you to follow me in the back. You have these passages. John chapter 15, verse 11. Let's look at that real quick. Watch this. Just stay with me for a second. You know why you don't have happy Christians? Because they're not focusing, because they're focusing on the fruit and not on the process. Okay? Can, can I tell you something? The one thing, and I, I want you to get this. Stay with me now. I'm, I'm not going to keep you here all day. 
The one thing you have to remember is the process is the only thing you have control over. Okay? I don't make the fruit grow. Okay? If I go out, how many of you have tried doing gardening before? And how many of you have read directions and did it just like everybody else does and it turned out like junk? I don't have a green thumb. I have black hands. My hands to, to fruit and to, to trees, these are the hands of death. My sister grows all kinds of stuff. She tells me how to do it. She even told me something crazy. She said, if you have a flowering plant, put coffee in it. I put coffee in that plant, that thing died. Just a couple of years ago, we actually, Sister Sweeney and I actually coaxed this little tomato tree or, or vine or whatever to produce tomatoes. We were so proud. We were able to work. We worked on, I worked on that thing every day. And I realized that God did not call me the gardening because I got like, man, we got like 10 tomatoes off of it, passed it on to Kim, and she killed it. She killed my baby. You killed my baby. No, she killed my baby. But it took me all summer to get 10 tomatoes off one vine. I tried a cucumber thing. That thing died in the process because I, I could only focus on one thing. Okay? So I want you to understand that you have no control over the fruit. You don't make the fruit grow. You control the process. Okay? That's how it is in our relationship with Christ. We don't make the fruit grow. We control the process. In other words, I control how much I pray. I control how much I read scripture. I control how much I give. I control how often I come to church. I control what I do for God. See, God allows me to handle that. Do you know why you have un unhappy Christians? Because all they focus on is the fruit. And you know what? You are not short of preachers who will, who will help you focus on the fruit. You know how preachers help you focus on the fruit? If you give an offering, God will do this. If you do this, God will do that. Can I tell you something? I want to show you something today about fruit. Okay, I'm going to show you something today about fruit. And I want you to get this. You know how preachers get up and, and, and they, they, they want to tell you how you can become successful? I want you to keep that in your mind today. Okay? I want you to keep that in your mind today. But I want to show you something very quickly about why Christians are unhappy. John chapter 5, verse 11. Is it up? Oh, man, that is fabulous. Actually, I don't even need, need this. My guys are going to do this for me. These things have I spoken unto you, what? That my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Okay? Next scripture, John 17, 13. Anybody know what John 17 is? Come on, theologians. Come on, come on, pastors who are about to go into a study class. What is John 17? Come on, Virgil, you know what it is because you talk about it all the time. Huh? The prayer for the church. It is Christ praying for the disciples and for the church. Okay? What does he say? You ever thought about what, in John chapter 17, it gives you some insight into the conversation that's probably still going on between God and Christ. Okay? Look at what he says in verse 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have what? My joy. My joy. Okay? So in, in, chapter, in chapter 15, verse 11, what does he say? That my joy might be in you, and your joy might be full. Amen? Then in 17, 13, he says, Now that I come to thee, and these things I speak in this world, that they might have my joy, watch this, fulfilled in them. Okay? Again, fulfilled. Can I tell you something? Watch now, watch. You don't control the fruit. You control the process. I want you to get this. He says, my joy. Amen? My joy does what? Makes your joy complete. Amen? Okay, go over to the last one I gave you guys there. It is John chapter 20, verse 19 to 23. Watch this. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, 
came Jesus and stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you, go. And when he had said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw him. Watch this. When did they get happy? When did they get joyful? When they saw him. Okay? So, once again, based on 15 and 17, our joy is what? His joy. And then on 20, again, they, they begin to be joyful. Why? Because of him. You got it? Why do we have unhappy Christians? Okay, because they focus on the fruit. All right, let's go on. John chapter 20, go. 21. Thank you, sir. Then said Jesus to them again, peace, again, peace be unto you as my Father has sent me, I am sending you. Okay. Okay, now we're beginning to see what we control. Okay? Now we're beginning to see what we control. Go on. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Go. Watch this. What does he say after that? Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whoever sins ye retain, they are retained. Now watch this. There will be those who would want to say, I'm telling you this is a falsehood. Those who would want to say, well, we have the power to decide. No, we don't. What he is talking about is that we are going to preach the gospel. When I get up here on Sunday morning, I'm going to preach a message to you. You are going to respond with a yes or a no. That is what this is talking about. The power of the Holy Spirit working in my life has given me the ability to proclaim what Jesus said. And you will have to respond to what Jesus said. So I have the power to preach a message that causes your sins to be unforgiven because you refuse to repent or have the power to preach a message that causes you to come to Christ and repent of your sin. But I want you to get this. There is the fruit that is joy, joy, peace, peace that's dependent on Jesus and then there is the process of working in this world that God has called us to. So I'm not a fruit bearer unless I am first a cultivator of the fruit that I'm going to bear. I don't care what you say, that's good preaching. Okay, Unless I'm a cultivator of the fruit, I am not going to bear said fruit. But we always focus on the fruit, and that's why we're not happy. See, unhappy Christians, unhappy Christians are Christians who aren't doing anything for God. Unhappy Christians are not cultivating. They're focusing, and isn't that what the the enemy does to us? Isn't that what he does? He says, focus on the fruit. Okay, let's let's go back to the knife here. Can, Can I tell you something? So, Sweeney, what am I cutting with this? Thought I'd miss, didn't you? Huh? I wouldn't do that twice, just once. But in, when the fruit is good, come on, somebody. You guys should be getting there now. See, rotten fruit, you, can't, you can smell rotten fruit no matter where it's at. Okay? I'm serious, you can. Right now, that doesn't smell bad. Okay? When you go into a, into a, 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 not a vineyard, into an apple orchard, the smell, you're going to go, man, that smells good. It's actually the rotted fruit. Okay? All right? You can't get the odor of fresh fruit until it's been pruned. Now, that smells good. And once you've smelled this, This just smells sweet and sickening. You got what I'm saying? See, we don't control the fruit. We control the process that ultimately results in the fruit. So this is what the world does. And this is these are preachers that are also preaching worldly ideals. 
Now, when I'm saying what I'm saying, I know that I am stepping on the toes or challenging a lot of preconceived understanding of this whole giving thing of God. Okay? But I, I want to do this. I would like for 10 people, and, and I took all the ratchet stuff that I touched out, by the way. I would like 10 people to come up here and pick a piece of fruit that you're going to eat. You have to eat it. I mean, not, to, not right this moment, but you're going to take it out and wash it and come back in and take a bite in front of everybody. Okay. Don't be scared. There's nothing in these apples. I promise. That's one, two, three, four, five. There's six. Virgil, seven. Let me see. Two. Just ten people. Come on, I'm not going to try to count. Y'all know what ten is. It's two handfuls unless you lost a finger. Okay? It's two handfuls unless you lost a finger. That's ten. Okay? And, and do me a favor. Don't go out and wash it with, like, soap and water and all that. Just rinse the thing off and come back. Let's move on. While they're doing that, let's move on. Let's go back to Scripture. I want to read something to you. You know how, 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 how preachers are always getting up preaching, man, if you send an offering, then, you know, something good's going to happen to you. Uh, if you send an offering, I'm going to send you my little prayer cloth. I was in Jerusalem. Good, man, go ahead. Okay, I, I was in Jerusalem, and, and I, was, I was at the Wailing Wall. Okay, come on, pay attention here. I was at the Wailing Wall, and I began to sweat because it was hot in Jerusalem, and I took my shirt off, and I got back to the hotel room because that's anointed sweat because God spoke to me, and I cut that shirt up in little pieces, and I will send you a piece of that shirt. If you send $1,000 to my ministry, you put that piece of shirt in your wallet, and over seven days or 70 days or 90 days or whatever they give you, that's going to cause your finances to grow. Anybody ever heard messages like that? Uh, now, I'm not saying that message, that's it, instinctively me. I'm trying to be obnoxious. But you've heard messages like that. Everybody who got an apple, come in here, stand in front of church, and take a bite. Heavenly Father, in the name of you. No, I'm just kidding. All right, took a bite. You can eat the rest of the apple. It's okay. Rob, that was a special apple that Lori picked out for you. You're not getting your prenup. You're not getting your prenup. Let me just say that. Sit down quickly. Come on, Pastor Burrell. I've seen you eat worse when we've been out at dinner. There we go. Come on, Sharon. Come on. Don't look at me. Look at them. They need to see. Okay. Right, George started eating his apple before he even got down here. That's my kind of guy right there. Okay, now, we still need to see you take a bite. There we go. Take a bite. There we go. Valerie trying to make Virgil choke. Are you going to come up and take a bite, handsome? Come on. Take a bite in front of everybody. Let them see you. Awesome. Good job. Okay, now, can, I, can I read a passage of Scripture to you that just seems out of place in chapter 15? according to our theology, all right? Let, let me just read something that seems like it's really out of place. Verse 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that, you're, that you bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Come on, let, let me read it to you again real slow this time. Watch this, watch this. If ye abide in me, how many times have you heard people preach this? You can ask what you will in my name and it will be given unto you. You don't have to worry about it. God said he got you. You give an offering to our ministry. If you will do uh, item one, item two, item three, then that's going to force God's hand to bless you. If you do this, if you do that, if you give this, if you give that, let me just tell you this. You cannot control the fruit. You can only control the process. So I'm 
here to tell you if you give, you should give, you should pray, you should read the word. But whatever happens in your life, God doesn't owe it to you. He is sovereign and he will do what he wants, when he wants, how he wants. You can pray for a new car all you want. But if God gives you a 1955 Ford Hoopty, it's still new to you. And that's his will for you to drive. And you should drive it until something happens because God has a plan for our lives. Let me just tell you, I cannot control the fruit that is born in my life. All I can do is pray and plant and water and do the work. And then the fruit is going to manifest itself by the good will of God. How do I know that? Come on. Read it again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. You know what we like to do? You know what we like to do? Anybody know what we like to do? They're up here looking at me like, what's he going to say? Pastor Bro, you know what we like to do? We just go straight with you. You know what we like to do? This is what we like to do. We like to read a verse and stop because it fits what we want to have happen. Can I tell you something? Let's stop focusing on verses and read the whole book. You hear what I'm saying? So what we do is, if I wanna, if I wanna hit people, if I wanna hit some good Christian folk up for money, I just gotta come up with a couple verses. They don't have to be social. They don't have to be associated with one another. They don't have to even. I don't have to read before or after. All I gotta do is come up with a verse. This is Robert. If you give, God will give it back to you. You can ask what you want in Jesus' name. Will you want that card? You ask in Jesus' name. That is not with this passage. It is not what this passage is saying. Matter of fact, matter of fact, man, don't throw them good apples away. No, I'm just kidding. Watch it. If ye abide in me, verse 7, and my words abide in you, you guys got it up, put it up for me, and then we're going to go to the next verse. If you guys will put it up. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Fellas, okay, stay. Keep your finger on the button, because now I want you to flip over to eight. Flip back to seven. Flip over to eight one more time. Now back to seven. That's punishment for not paying attention. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Those guys, they put up with a lot for me. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And then we want to stop, but go to verse 8. Herein. Herein. Jesus is connecting the statements. He's not starting new. He's connecting the statements. Herein, or by this, is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. Can I tell you something? We focus so much on the fruit. God's focused on the process. Because the fruit is a result of the process. You can't buy a blessing. It has to be grown. It has to be loved on, prayed over. In, in, in other words, I didn't walk up to Sister Sweeney. We're back to the bride again. I didn't walk up to Sister Sweeney one day and go, hey, girl, let's have a baby. Get it done. Amen. Nor did I say, let's have a baby, get it done, and then go. That's what doctors look like in the delivery room. And we pay them a lot of money to do that. Is, is that how you guys had your children? Edgar just walk up to you and say, girl. 
by the night, I want a baby. When I get home from work, I want a steak dinner and a baby in the crib. Okay? But listen, listen, we do that with God all the time. Okay? My wife carried our children nine months. It was nine months of cheese and shrimp and pickles and my back hurts, my feet hurt. I'm in a bad mood today. Get out of my face, you smell like coffee. She says 10 months. Hopefully none of y'all carried your babies more than 10 because now you're getting to like the elephant thing. It didn't happen right away, did it? Seed had to be planted. Then the, then the woman became, the bride became impregnated. Okay? Then it was cultivated and grown. What happens? Neonatal vitamins. The right diet. Okay? The, the baby draws, watch this. While it's being cultivated, the baby draws on the nutrients of the mother. That's why mothers take vitamins many times. A baby, carrying a baby, a baby will suck the calcium right out of your body. Am I right, ladies? Am I right? Okay? Baby will suck the nutrients right out of your body. Okay? Why? Because it's being cultivated. There's a process. While the baby is in the mother's stomach, it has to be taken care of. See, what we want to do is we want to go to God and, and, and pass for let me see your wallet. Boy, I know you choking with cash. He works for the same people I do. I know better than that. Watch. We want to go to God and say, get it done. Sorry, Pastor Bro. Hopefully you can have your glasses or something in there. Get, get it done. When I come back, when I get up from praying, I should have my blessing. You can't throw money at God. You can't throw prayers at God. Okay? You can't. You know why? Because you have to cultivate what you get from God, and you don't control the fruit. Okay? Why is that? Scripture. Because that you bear much fruit brings glory to God. Can, can I tell you something? Do you know why there are people around us who, who don't come to church? And, and I'm closing. I'm closing, Pastor Burrell. You know why there are people around us that don't come to church? Because of the fruit that we bear. I, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. Of all the people that came up here, nobody took this one. Nobody took this one. Does anybody here want to take a bite? I thought, you don't have to run, man. I was just asking the question. But I want you to notice, this was the only piece of fruit that was in a pretty container. Isn't that beautiful? Look at that. If anybody here will take a bite of this, you can have this. It looks like silver. I'm in church. I can't lie and say it is. It looks like silver. Isn't it beautiful? I have used this prop to preach a lot of sermons. This prop is anointed by God, and you can have it if you just take a bite of this apple. And yet nobody chose this. Why? Because the fruit is bad. This is an unhappy Christian. You know why we're unhappy Christians? Because we're chasing the pretty stuff. We think an offering's going to move God. We think that because our grandmother was a Christian, it's going to move God. Sister Porter can't think because mommy is a Christian and prays that that qualifies her. It doesn't. As a matter of fact, it actually puts you in a worse position because mommy's praying for you. No one chose this. But can I tell you something? We choose this all the time. And we choose it based on 
what it appears to be. This is how Satan works. Satan says, I'm going to give you something that's bad for you, but I'm going to put it in a nice container. And many times we are sold on it without looking inside. And so what we have to remember is that the process of bearing fruit is supposed to bring glory to God. And what do people see in us? Let, let me tell you what people see. This, this, is, this is where I'm closing, and we'll pick up in two weeks. Watch this. I know you guys aren't going to like this. But you may like it. I don't know. But watch this. I have to put this down so you got to listen good. There's something wrong with the mic. It's not me. Anyway, once people see the real us, this is why we're not happy, because we're not bearing healthy fruit. Oh, yeah, it could be in a beautiful container, and that's what preachers want you to do. They want you to put it in this beautiful container. But can I tell you something? You know what's happening? You know what happens in our lives? Ultimately, we come to a place where circumstances or trials or tribulations or whatever takes the lid off our life. And we find out what we thought we had, we don't. And we're left sad and angry and abandoned. And we forget that this beautiful exterior is going to crumble and go away. But fruit lasts forever. See, because the one thing that this has, that this now doesn't, the ability to reproduce. It doesn't have it anymore. This has the ability to reproduce. And what some of us have done is we have sold out for that one-time thing rather than saying, you know what? Let me work on the process. Let God handle the harvest. How can you back that up, Pastor? What does Scripture say? Scripture says some plant and some water, but only God gives the increase. Let's stop focusing on the fruit. Let's focus on the cultivation. So Sweeney and I, we've been married 25 years in February. We have a wonderful, I, I think, I'm speaking for me, I have a wonderful marriage. It hasn't been good every day. It hasn't been wonderful for 25 years. So Sweeney and I, in our relationships, have had to deal with one another's baggage, and we've had to get the shovel out and get dirty. 
Sister Sweeney's had to pray for me. And I like what Pastor Nelson prayed this morning. He said he prayed for Sister Sweeney. And he said, I love Sister Sweeney. She doesn't always get the credit. And he talked about her standing behind me. There have been times that Sister Sweeney has had to just simply get on her knees and pray that I get myself together. Cultivating the hard stuff. Some of you are here today, and you think, wow, man, there's something wrong with me and God. God isn't getting it. No, no, God is getting it. Maybe God is saying to you, I don't want you to focus on the fruit. I just want you to get dirty a little bit. I want to cultivate. I want to water. Or maybe you're here, and it's beginning, you're beginning to see growth in your life, but God says, you know what, I'm going to cut it back a little bit because it's not quite as fruitful as I want it to be. That's those Christians that feel like, man, I, I had it going really well. Things were going well. Now, why all of a sudden am I in this situation? Because God says, you know, I'm going to cut it back a little bit. Because at the end of the day, what does it say? If you guys would put that up there one more time, Virgil. Put, that, put verse 8 up there one more time. This is, this is the, the crux of the message today. Look, herein is my Father glorified. That's it. It's not about me. It's not about the fruit. It's about the glory or the glorification of God. Because ultimately, isn't that why we're here? We're not, we don't reach people because we have stuff. We don't reach people because we're successful. The world is surrounded by successful people. And you know what else? Watch this. You don't reach people because you have a big house. You don't reach people because you got a nice car. I said to Sister Sharon on Saturday, by the way, she's fixing up the back of her car, and I walked up to her and said, I want to let you know something. There's a certain level of snack that should come out of the trunk of a Mercedes. Okay? Everybody else giving away candy. Okay? I'm expecting like a burger or, you know, little steakums or something. Hey, I never went back because I was afraid of what Sister Sharon would give me. Hey, but there's, there's a certain level of, of something that should come out of the, the trunk of a Mercedes. Okay? Of course, I was just kidding. But it, it, let, let me just say, it works perfect in my sermon, so she's just going to have to sacrifice. People are not going to be one because she drives a Mercedes. They're not going to be one because you have a lot of money that you can throw around and take everybody to lunch. But watch this. People aren't going to be one either because you're poor. They're not going to be one because you are struggling to make it. They're not going to be one because, because they see you out scrumping around in the trash can and say, what are you doing? You say, praise God, I'm looking for dinner. It's not going to win people to Jesus either. Say, Pastor, then what is it? What's going to win people is how you behave in your Mercedes. How you behave in your big house. How you behave with all your money. Because the world's under the impression that once you get money, you act foolish. The world, we need rich folks who are generous. We need rich folk who will stand up and say, yeah, I give my money to the church. Do you see how the world laughed at Ben Carson because he mentioned something about 10%? They treated him like he was the, the court jester, like some kind of fool. Can I tell you something? If the United States of America, let me go on record as saying it. I'm with Ben Carson. I don't even know what the man fully said. So I'm going to say it my way. I'm running for president. And if I become president of the United States, we're going to take 10% of all of the taxes that come in and give it to the church. Yeah, I'm just that crazy. You realize how much deficit we have? You realize how big my God is? And if you will vote me as president of the United States of America, I will give 10% of all of our taxes to the church. I got one vote. Can I tell you something? I guarantee you in a very short period of time, this country will be well evangelized, will become godly again, okay, and will be rich beyond, China will be borrowing from us. 
you do know that we as a godly nation, quote unquote, borrow from the communist. What's wrong with that? And people aren't going to be one because you're out picking garbage out of a trash can or because you can't pay your bills. They're going to be one by how you behave in that situation. They're going to be one because of your fruit. Your fruit isn't your money. Your fruit isn't your bank account, your car, your house, or lack thereof. Your fruit is a result of your relationship. Sorry. Marquita, sorry, darling. Oh, that was yours, Brittany. Sorry. I didn't tear it. Oh. I hope no kids are here. Your fruit is a result of your connection with the king and that's what's going to win people amen so let me ask you a question here today I'm done some of you are saying thank God let's talk about your fruit I don't want to hear that you need prayer for the sick Let's, let's not talk about that. That's important. Don't miss That's important. But let's not pray for the sick right now. Let's not pray for finances. Let's not pray for salvation for our loved ones. Let's pray for fruit. You know why? Because all that other stuff is in there. Let's pray for fruit. So let me ask you a question this morning. This is, this is the altar call. This is the altar call. And I broke the coat hanger. This is, this is the altar call. Today, today, all right, this is what I want you to do. This is just another crazy thing. I want you to check your fruit. And this is what I want you to do. The altar call today is for fruit. Where, what is your fruit looking like? Are you as fruitful as you should be, or, or is God pruning you back? Have you been cultivating and planting? Have you been giving? Have you been praying? We get hung up in that whole 10% in giving. You know what's important about giving? What's important about giving is that you want to. That's what's important. We get caught up in the fact that that's, that's what Jesus meant. See, we get caught up in, oh, man, they gave $100,000, and we've got this rich person that supports our church, and we have this, and we have... See, God doesn't care about that. A millionaire should give a million dollars. That doesn't impress God. If your 10% every week is $500, then you should give it. You're not impressing God. That is your reasonable service. No one impressed God? Jesus sitting there, sitting right by the money box. All these rich people coming and dropping in the chingage. Little widow woman comes by and tink. Jesus said, did you see that? Yeah, what? She gave more than anybody. I'm like, come on, Jesus, you're crazy. Jesus said she gave all she had. What Jesus was saying is that what she gave was sacrificial. What everyone else gave was dutiful. God responds to sacrifice, not duty. So this morning, I want you to check your fruit. And this is what I want to have happen. If you know that your fruit needs to be better, you know that you're not bearing the fruit that you should, or you know that God is checking you, 
in your heart right now. This isn't about sin, by the way. It's not about sin. This is just, you know what, I'm in a place in my life that I want God to check my fruit. This is right on the heels of the me fast. I want God to check my fruit. I want to make sure that I look like this and not that. I want you to get up as they're leading us. I want you to walk by here. I want our pastoral staff to be on this side. Okay? Okay, I want, I want you guys over here. I want you to come by this table. I want you to pick up a piece of fruit. This is the command. That's what I want you to do. I want you to go home and cut it up. Cut it up in seven pieces, if it's possible, or any derivative thereof, but seven if you can. I want you to put it in a freezer bag and stick it in your freezer. want to serve as a reminder from now until January 1st that we're asking God to check our fruit and this is what you're going to do once you pick this fruit up I just want you to walk by I don't want you guys touching them you just walk by like this and they'll reach they'll, they'll extend their hand and pray for you and you just walk right on around and into the back and back to your seat and we'll close so if you're here you say, you know what, God, need, you need to check my fruit. I need to check myself. I'm checking my attitude. I'm checking my intentions. I'm checking my desires. I'm checking all of that. God, I'm giving you permission to check me. I want you to come by and pick up an apple. Just walk past them. They're going to be praying for you. You're going to take it home, cut it up, put it in a freezer bag, stick it in the freezer. And you say, for the next two months, God, until January 1, and I'll tell you January 1 in our New Year's Eve service what to do with it after that. Amen? 